Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, as much as the immigrant story changes, it, it stays the same. And if you are within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And uh, if you like how we do things around here, I'm assuming you do, because you're listening right now, uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, basically wherever you get your podcasts. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seeds YouTube channel, so if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we'd really appreciate it. Also, you can follow us on the social media, as the kids call it, you can find us over on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at uh, at In The Seats, or at It's Podcast One for all sorts of updates. And finally, and I've said this a lot, but it's it's the most important one, uh, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the film, television, basically the moving image at large, because if we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come and read about it. So please... Stop on by. On this episode, we got an interesting one. Uh, we're looking at the movie Snakehead, which uh, was playing at the Toronto International Film Festival this past September, but it's also available on VOD platforms now. And it's the story of a uh, Chinese immigrant getting caught up in a international crime ring of human smuggling while attempting to to improve uh, her life and the life of her family. And it's... It's a crime story, but it's an immigrant story. It's an American story, really, in many ways. It's uh, been told uh, sort of yeah, in different iterations, but never quite like this. And we had the unique pleasure of sitting down with writer-director Evan Jackson uh, Leong to uh, talk about sort of the inspiration for the film, making of it, making it a, a sort of gritty New York story, and, you know, so very much more. And it's... Uh, we had a fun talk with Evan. We definitely think he is uh, someone to keep an eye on going forward because uh, he's uh, he started in the business really sort of uh, the hard way and has worked his way up through various things. And I think definitely think he's a talent that's going to be uh, we're going to be hearing a lot more from in the years to come in the filmmaking world because uh, uh, Snakehead really has a powerful uh, energy to it that you that you cannot shake and it's uh, worth watching, but. Uh, Check it out on all VOD platforms now. It's starring uh, Sun Kang, uh, Shia Shang, uh, Celia Ao, and a few other people. It's, uh, it's a great film. Like I said, it is on VOD platforms now. But first, check out our talk with Evan, because uh, between you and me, it's a good one. Now, I mean, I guess my first thing is just obviously congratulations on the movie, because I mean... I really think it is. I mean, I know the tagline is it's an American crime story, but I mean, it is an American crime story because it's an immigrant American crime story. Yeah. Walk me through sort of the origin of this story and wanting to tell it. Sure, sure, sure. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I grew up watching, you know, Godfather, Goodfellas and, you know, all those underworld crime stories in America right in the 80s, the 90s, and then the, the Hong Kong triad and the, and the, and the, the Japanese Yakuza films. And so I always wanted to make an underworld movie, right? And the world story. And, uh, you know, if I want to see one with characters that look like me, that talk like me, and, you know, I had to be in America. So, cause I'm from America. And, um, you know, when I heard of this woman, uh, Sister Ping and, and the story of what she did in, in New York Chinatown and smuggling hundreds of thousands of, you know, Fujianese into New York I was like that's the story that's the world I want to I want to I want to live in and I want to explore and you know really it's it's you know and, and for me it was you know I wanted to make a story about a badass Asian woman you know because we don't you know at the time I was writing this 2007 there weren't a lot of these kind of stories there's a lot more now you know but when I was first writing the script uh, in 2007 2008 this was like wow this is so exciting because we never really got to see something like this before and uh, you know I mean Took a little while, but here we are. Now, tell me how you found that badass Asian woman, because I mean, man, it's there are some great performances in this film you got from the entire cast. Oh, how oh how I found the cast? Yeah, you? yeah, see, you. oh man, see, you. I mean, so we did a you know a nationwide, worldwide open call for this, right? I mean, the thing is about Asian American film community is that we pretty much know everybody, you know, and so 
we, we, we were looking for everyone and any, anyone that could fill that role. Right. And I was really looking for someone that, you know, I, you know, that, that performed on a level of like, I, I, I'm afraid, but I want to watch. Right. You know? And I think that's the sort of the story of any alpha male in any gangster film, right? You, you never want to meet them, and but you would do want to watch what they do. And I think that's what, you know, um, Suya brought to the table, right? Because what she did was, you know, we watched her audition tape and I was like, man, I'm afraid of her, but I want to watch her. And, and uh, you know, she... There's one thing about, you know, acting confident and then yeah. being confident. And she brought this confidence of, that was I, I was I've never really seen before. And, you know, that was really special. Now, I mean, something else I love about the film is that, I mean, it felt very New York. And by New York, I mean, it felt like 70s New York, 80s New York. It felt a little dirty. Mm-hmm. How important was it for you to have a film that wasn't necessarily glossy and shiny, but really felt like almost grimy? In many yeah. ways. No, I mean, that was very conscious choice, right? I mean, style and, and visuals are, is kind of like my strengths, you know? So going into anything, you, you, you lean on your strengths and, you know, don't really worry about your weaknesses too much. So you're faced with them. And, uh, you know, and so we had a very, me and my sense, I had a really, really strong look of what we wanted to paint in as Chinatown, right? Um, one thing we wanted to do is make sure that Chinatown was a character, right? And, you know, my cinematographer, you know, he grew up in New York Chinatown, so we knew that, you know, the world that we're going to paint in New York Chinatown it has to be this place that we all um, feel, you know, that we're always, uh, and we wanted to make sure that it was this, you know, beautiful, dark underworld, right? And, you know, I think that's the thing. When you walk around New York Chinatown, we're not pushed too far because it, it just feels like that. You walk in New York Chinatown at night and you could just feel the buildings and the streets. Like, they have so much soul, so much stories so much uh, um, layers of, of depth would happen on those streets. And so it's very easy just to shoot those and your sets there, right? And, um, you know, I think, you know, being grimy and being that, and that's New York. It's easy yeah. to, you know, shoot that and make it feel like that. No, I mean, I'm curious because, I mean, obviously, I mean, I, I knew of the stuff you did with Jeremy for, for Linsanity in the documentary, and like, I'm kind of curious, was this always the first feature in your mind? Like, how did like because yeah. documentarians tend to be documentarians and then feature mm-hmm. filmmakers tend to be fil- feature filmmakers. You don't yeah. see a lot of bouncing back and forth. Like, I'm yeah. just curious from <laughs> how you got from that to here. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I was always my mind, you know, pie in the sky was always to be to do narrative feature film, um, you know, since I started. But, you know, when I started, I was doing documentaries and documentaries were really you know, even up to Jeremy, no one really cared about documentaries. And so, you know, I mean, we could talk about the Michael Moore, stuff like that, but it wasn't so like the last five years that Netflix really put documentaries on the map for people. Yeah. So it wasn't that cool. And I did it because I could do it. And because, you know, basically I, I had to pay the bills. Um, and, you know, Jeremy was one of those many projects that you know, see early on and it blossomed to this gigantic redwood tree, you know, and and so, you know, you know, the, the transitioning, you know, made it, you know, two things. I think technically I was fully ready to make a movie, but then the other part was that I was a little more overconfident of like going into this sort of format is a very different format, right? Narrative storytelling is a very different format. And I underestimated how much of a, how much of a relearning I'm going to have to do. And, you know, I had to really relearn that in post for this movie. And so, you know, um, that transition, you know, as an artist, you know, you're kind of just kind of always looking for the next challenge, right? And, you know, for me, it's, you know, music video, documentary, we did this, we did that. Okay, what's the next one? And the next one's feature film. And I mean, hopefully I can stay here and get another shot on the, on the uh, you know, the bigger level. But, you know, that that's really what I was, I was, I was aiming for since the beginning of, of my career. Now, I mean, there's something else about Snakehead, because, I mean, it's obviously representative and you know showing culture but at the same time it doesn't feel cheap or or token or any in that in any kind of way and i mean i'm curious how has response been from the asian community sort of in general as you've turned it around and people have gotten to see the film because i mean it's not the prettiest experience but it's probably a very honest experience for a lot of people out there yeah you know i mean obviously i think when we don't have a lot as an Asian community, we don't have a lot of films or a lot of media about it. So anytime one comes up, we're going to 
like be hypercritical about it. We're very smart community. We're very like, that's not me. That's not who we are. But, you know, again, like there's so much diversity within who we are. I'm sixth generation Chinese American. So I have almost zero sort of experience that I relate to. I'm not zero, but I have very little uh, in common with these first generation immigrants, even my wife, right? It's just, we have a very different experience. And so, you know, the way I look at things, the way she looks at things is very different. And um, obviously you're going to get more of that from, but, you know, ultimately, I think it's just been overall, we've been getting fairly good response from the community because, you know, I think we're, we're smart enough to know that we have connect, we need to have a spectrum of work and different stories, right? And, you know, again, like being authentic <coughs> to the world and authentic to the story, I think ultimately that's what people really um, are critical about in the first, in, in the end, in, in, the, in, the, in anyways, right? Because, you know, I think if you do a cheap job, if you make it, you know, token, if you make it, you know, one dimensional, then it's a bad story. And then it's even easier to get in that. But because I think people see the layers of, uh, of, of themes and, 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 and the effort that we put to stay authentic on some levels, you know, people are like, oh, that's, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. And so, you know, um, so far this response has been, you know, great. I mean, I think we're past the idea of, of like, what is, you know, we can't portray our people in a certain way. I yeah. think we're past that, you know, and I think, you know, going forward, it's like, okay, we just need more opportunities so we can see more different kinds of stories, right? I mean, we the immigrant experience has always played in a certain way and that's great, but we can have other films too, right? We could have Minari, we could have Snakehead, right? We can go yeah. both ways, right? But I think the problem is, is Hollywood only makes one kind of film and only puts up one kind of film for our community. So, you know, that, that's what happens. Now, I mean, I'm curious because, like, talk to me a little bit just about, I guess, maybe career path, because no one ever has a straight line. Like, how does somebody go from being an assistant on a Fast and Furious movie to sort of doing their own features? Is it just persistence and hard work or like, is there a like, is there a route or is it just a question of the hustle? I think it's I think it's a question of the hustle. Right. Um, this is in, in knowing that this is a marathon. Right. I, I when I was in my 20s, I thought I'd be. I thought I would be rep by CA making Fast and Furious 8, you know, by the time I was 30, right? And, you know, it doesn't really work like that, right? I think um, you got to put your time in, you got to put your effort in. The thing is, you know, it's, I think it takes that long to build the craft. I don't think you really, you know, unless you have opportunities day in, day out, most of us don't. And so, you know, the few opportunities you get, you learn so much and, you know, you build on that and you build on that and you get to a shot where, you know, you're going to get your shot. And it's just a matter of if you have enough experience to hit that shot out of the park, right? Yeah. You're going to get the pitch. And, and so that's why I kind of look at my career. It's like I hung around long enough. So I'm going to be successful. I hope, I hope we're going to be successful. But, you know, I really think of this sort of journey as, as like a long marathon that, you know, I was taught early on. I was like, look, you can go work at a studio. You can go up the ladder and go very slowly up that way. But eventually you're just going to become this kind of filmmaker. Right. And if you go this other way and make a name, make a voice and go to your craft, you'll get to be the filmmaker you want to be. And then the money will be a lot better because you get to dictate what you want to do on the level you want to make. And, you know, that's what always sort of been my goal as, as a filmmaker and an artist. Right. I, I don't I didn't really want to make things for other people. I want to make things for myself. And, um, you know, I think this is, you know, getting here is just another step in the process. Now I'm curious. Now thinking back to sort of the early days, the young days, what were what were the filmmakers and what were the movies that sort of made the light bulb go off in your head and be like, okay, I gotta do this. This is this is my purpose. This is my job. I gotta be a filmmaker. I mean, when I yeah, when I started filmmaking, uh like Zach, I'm gonna be a director. I mean, I, I just basically went back to the books, right? And this is the early 2000s. So there was a lot of fun films at the time, right? Um, you know, and that was like it was like the sun Sundance in the early 2000s and the 90s was like that's where real filmmaking came. For sure, right, yeah. I mean, now it's like, you know, it is still, but it's, you know, you have these big stars in Hollywood, like Sundance back then was a different sort of era. And so, um, yeah, you know, at the same time, I was just getting introduced to, you know, international stuff, right? So basically, you know, early on was, you know, the Wong Kar Wai, right? Wong Kar was making films at the time, right? Um, I mean, Old Boy came out at the time, right? So I was really influenced by a lot of Asian directors, Um you know, and then I went even further back, man. I went back to Kurosawa. I went back and watched all those. And I'm like, a true master. You know, even the search 
Leone's, I mean, that whole era for me was really, really fun and realized like, okay, these, all the things that we do now are from that era. They're just done faster and quicker now. Um, you know, I think, you know, Chunking Express blew my mind when I watched that film. I, I, I was like, you can make movies like this and they can be good. And, you know, and you can, you can play in this space that um, no one really ever does. And, and, and I love that. I think that was like that, that, that blew my mind that you could happen. Right. I mean, Pulp Fiction is like sort of, you know, from that and, you know, even Pulp Fiction for me, it was super exciting at the time when it came out. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I think I definitely love more of the edgier things of that era. Um, but all of it was just, you know, I, I, I mean, I go back and forth of what, what was important to me as a filmmaker. I mean, I love that you say Wong Kar Wai, though, because I saw a little bit of that in Snakehead, just the way with some of the neon shots and all that. I'm like, shit, this guy's got style. I like this, you know. It really it really allows you to create something sort of visually engaging and character-driven engaging. And I'm kind of curious, for you going forward, like, what's the hope? What's the dream? Is it more projects that are representative of the culture, or is it just a question of just making stories that you want to make? Yeah, I mean, I think... I don't want to continue to develop my, the craft as a director, obviously, but you know, yeah, it's definitely moving and, and telling stories that I want to tell, right? And and for me, um, I have realized that you know if I'm not passionate about story, I don't have a reason to do it. I mean, it's just money. Then I should not be a part of that project. And you know what I you know what I think has always been the the, the true sort of. Uh, uh, sort of theme and all my work is you know i love doing the story of the underdog right i mean jeremy lynn and justin lynn all these stories and think it this is the story of the underdog and and the story the underdog feels is exciting to me because it's the one that's that's underestimated that no one really looks at till they get their shot you know and they come out and they blow it up and i think that's um you know that's sort of my journey here in america right and i think that's and any asian american you have to you know, work very, very hard. So when you get that one chance and that one opportunity, you can blow it out of the water. And, and that's, you know, sort of my, my path. Well, I think you did with Snakehead, man, because it's it's really a gripping film with some fantastic performances. And I think you did a great job. And keep up the good work and keep doing the good work. And thanks for the time today, man. Thank you. Appreciate the time. Appreciate right. the interest. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs.